Robinson Lecture, which is sponsored by the Law and Technology Institute here at CUA. Professor Zobel and I are the co-directors of the Law and Technology Institute. The Law and Technology Institute has played an important role at Catholic for over 30 years. It's played an important role in the communications bar, in the legal profession more generally, and in fact, our roots date back to the founding of our law school and the founding dean of our law school, William Callahan Robinson, who proclaimed in 1890 in his leading treatise on patent law, the Law of Patents, that the time had come for the Law of Patents to be successfully treated as a department of jurisprudence. William Robinson was a truly interesting and influential person, having been a law school dean, a law professor, a legal scholar, and a judge. In 1895, he was appointed professor and named as the founding dean of the Law School of the Catholic University of America. A graduate of Dartmouth College, Dean Robinson was a lecturer and professor of law at Yale University and served as a judge on the Court of Common Pleas in Connecticut before joining our faculty. He was a prominent scholar in the area of patent law, and over a century later, it is clear that his impact on patent law continues and endures, as his works have been cited in opinions by the Supreme Court, the United States Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, United States District Courts, scholarly articles, casebooks, and treatises. This long history and tradition of the study of intellectual property continues to thrive here at Catholic and grow alongside our communications law and information privacy offerings. The Law and Technology Institute offers a rich array of academic programs and provides a forum for the exchange of ideas among students, faculty, the professional community, and colleagues from around the country. While studying here at Catholic, students have the opportunity to take a variety of classes, explore complex and fascinating ethical and moral questions posed at the intersection of law and technology, and to gain ex practical experience through externship. With numerous full and part-time faculty members, a robust law and technology student law association, and distinguished alumni, such as the one we're hearing from tonight, um, in the judiciary, government, and private practice, our program prepares and trains students to become both ethical and successful lawyers. We are very pleased to honor Dean Robinson and his legacy today. Now I'd like to introduce Dean Stephen Payne, who will introduce our featured speaker, Nick Fizer. Thank you, Beth, and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, it's my honor to um, introduce uh, Nick Pfizer to you. Um, first, let me say one more word about uh, Dean William Callahan Robinson. Um, he, in addition to you know founding our law school here at the university, um, really kind of helped save my little law school called Yale in New Haven, um, where he was, uh, as, as you heard, a, a jurist and a, and a law professor for, for a while. Uh, uh, Yale was kind of foundering um, in the, uh, I think the 1870s or 80s, and he and a couple of other folks stepped in and really kind of kind of helped save that one too before, you know, founding the glorious one we have uh, before us um, here. Um, so anyway, um, welcome to, to Nick Beiser and, and his family, as I understand, uh, is with us today. Um, Nick uh, joined GoDaddy in 2012 and is currently general counsel marketing uh, and international for the company. Um, and I think he'll, he'll talk a little bit about that, but it's global marketing and all, also all the, you know, the ex-US business uh, support. His practice touches on all areas of the business and covers a broad spectrum of legal issues, including privacy, cybersecurity, commercial transactions, disputes of all types, employment issues, protection of the company's intellectual property, global policy, and mergers and acquisitions. Um, immediately prior to GoDaddy, Mr. Beiser worked at Network Solutions in Herndon, Virginia. And before that, he was associated to national law firms. He started his legal career in-house with MCI, uh, which for the young folks was one of the major phone companies and, and, uh, before you were born. Um, <laughs> Mr. Beiser graduated from Lafayette College in 1994 and the Columbus School of Law here at the Catholic University of America in 1999. He was born and raised here in Washington, D.C. Now lives in Alexandria, Virginia with his wife Amy and three daughters. Um, and let me just say, I had a wonderful time talking with Nick and Amy prior to the event here. And I just love our alums. Um, what, you know, uh, warm and gracious people. And so I especially encourage the students to take advantage of our outstanding 
outstandingly successful and nice alumni um, like Nick Beiser. Welcome, Nick. Thank you all. Let me start by saying thank you to the Law and Institute of Technology, or Law and Technology Institute. I'm sorry, and especially Professor Winston and Dean Payne for the invitation to speak with you all tonight. It's truly an honor to be here to speak with you. A lot's changed since I roamed the halls here. Back in my first year in 1996, I recall listening to a Maryland County Circuit judge who was uh, guest lecturing at our lawyer skills class. When he finished his lecture, the subject of which is long forgotten by me now, all I was concerned about was the response to this burning question. How does one address a panel of multiple judges? Is it your honors? Is it yours honor, like attorneys general? Or you just stick with the court? I didn't know. I raced up to the judge to ask him this all-important question. And I received what to this day remains some of the best advice I've ever received. Not just legal advice, but life, or but, but advice by which to live your life. The solemn response I received was this. Son, I don't care what you call me, so long as you don't call me an ass to my face. <laughs> that wasn't really the response I had expected, but it was a valuable response nonetheless. I've really tried like heck to live by that rule, notwithstanding one or two judges along the way who've uh, tested my resolve. Uh, as you'll soon find out, um, I'm concerned with a few other things. I don't do much public speaking, and I'm not great at PowerPoint, but I have a broad uh, scope of things on my plate, on my docket, that I'm worried about that I'll share with you. So, oh, it worked. All right. So uh, what is GoDaddy? Uh, we provide everything you need to get online to start a business, or just to have a website online for your family or whatever other uh, adventure you'd like to post. We can get you web hosting, we can provide email services, we can even do social media marketing for your small business, which by the way, for the Institute, creates a ton of intellectual property issues. Uh, so for example, if one of our customers is a bar or restaurant in, let's say, Dubuque, and they want to promote a Super Bowl party, our folks, our business folks, will send out a tweet saying, hey, Super Bowl party at O'Malley's. Well, as most of you probably know, the NFL does not take kindly to people using Super Bowl in uh, their ads or their marketing. So when the NFL, when the commissioner of the NFL writes a letter to the bar owner saying, hey, O'Malley's, you've used our trademark cease and desist, O'Malley's then comes to GoDaddy and says, hey, what did you get me into? So we try to keep them out of trouble, that is we try to keep our business out of trouble by telling our folks what they can and can't uh, tweet and, and uh, post on Facebook. Um, so what laws affect GoDaddy? Well, <laughs> given that we have over 19 million customers all around the world, offices in over 20 countries, and in all six continents, Antarctica doesn't count. Um, we are affected pretty much by every law there it is, or at least it feels that way to me. If compliance isn't taken seriously, the results can be disastrous, not only for the company, but for our customers' lives. So with that, let's take a look at the concerns we face, what we at GoDaddy have done, and are doing about those concerns, and what I hope is a little insight into the future. Few other areas, that was supposed to like blow up by the way, <laughs> so there are my PowerPoint skills at work. Uh, few other areas have blown up quite like privacy. These days it seems like every jurisdiction in the world wants to pass a law delivering their hot take on what it means to protect their uh, citizens' private information. 
Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> Uh, any discussion of privacy these days pretty much has to start with the general, uh, the general Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR, passed by the European Union. More than just covering privacy issues, it essentially created an entirely new frontier for the state of the law. It's the standard by which all privacy laws today are judged and examined. I could spend the entire lecture covering the GDPR, but I prefer not to bore you to the maximum extent possible, although I guess for some of you that's already too late. <laughs> Before we get to the regulation, though, I think it would be informative to ask ourselves what the great philosopher David Byrne once asked. Well, how did I get here? The right to privacy is generally first thought to be defined in an 1890 Harvard Law Review article by future Supreme Court Justice Louis Brandeis. Justice Brandeis famously said, the right to privacy is the right to be left alone. As I'm sure the common law scholars in attendance recall, Justice Brandeis famously dissented in the Olmstead case in 1928, a case about a federal wiretapping of a crew conspiring to violate the Prohibition Act. Brandeis was ahead of his time when speaking of the founders, he wrote, and I quote, they conferred, as against the government, the right to be let alone, the most comprehensive of rights, and the right most valued by civilized men. To protect that right, every unjustifiable intrusion, intrusion by the government upon the privacy of the individual, whatever the means employed, must be deemed a violation of the Fourth Amendment. And thanks to a college basketball gambler by the name of Charles Katz, who took his case all the way to the, his illegal wiretapping case, all the way to the Supreme Court, we now know that the right to be left alone applies in the US as that Katz case overturned Olmstead. So Justice Brandeis' dissent has actually been cited for years. Even 90 years later, in the 2018 case, Carpenter v. United States, where Chief Justice Roberts applied the same reasoning to the question of whether a person has a legitimate expectation of privacy in their location as provided by cell phone records. In the meantime, moving along the timeline, in 1948, the United Nations first recognized the right to privacy in its Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Then, in 1970, the first data protection law in the world was passed by Hessen, a state in Germany. Then we jump to 1995, when we first see the true foundations of the GDPR. The EU adopted the Data Protection Directive to protect individuals in connection with processing of their data. That directive contains many of the themes present in the GDPR, including transparency, legitimate purposes, which I'll get to in a little bit, and proportionality, actually all of which I'll touch on later. Importantly, it required that personal data could only be transferred to third, country, to, to third party countries if the third party country provided an, quote, adequate level of protection. I can see some of the students already saying, Okay, Boomer, enough with this history lesson. Let's get to the laws of this century, please. All right, so now we're on to the modern day. The data, protection, the data Protection Directive created a stir. If the EU required all of these requirements to be met, how do businesses transfer their records between, or to locations outside the EU? Especially because the US didn't really have any requirements on how to treat personal data, folks recognized the need to get some type of agreement in place uh, it's in place. Thus, we have the Safe Harbor Agreement of 2000. This allowed for companies to self-certify to the Commerce Department that they met seven basic principles to be deemed to be the adequacy standard of the EU. The adequacy standard, by the way, means the transfer of personal data to a country of the e outside the EU may only occur if the European Commission determines that the country provides an adequate level of protection of personal data. And that will become relevant later as well. Those seven principles are notice, meaning publishing of privacy policies and those types of policies. Choice, to be able to opt out of sharing your data. Onward transfer, third parties have to provide the same level of protection that you do. Security, 
Obviously, reasonable precautions need to be taken to protect that data. Data integrity, reliable data and relevant for the purpose used. Access, individuals have to be able to access their data and be able to correct it. Enforcement, and this is a big one, which I'll come back to in a minute, but it means that there must be remedial measures for violations. You'll hear these seven principles echoed in the GDPR. So everything is going smoothly until 2015, at least that's what we thought here in the US. But as it turns out, we weren't really doing a good job of enforcing those principles. So thanks to an idealistic Austrian law student by the name of Max Schrems, who was on semester abroad at Santa Clara Law School, the safe harbor in, uh, uh, agreement was invalidated by the European Court of Justice. The story goes that Schrems came to the US to continue his legal studies, and he saw some security cameras in the law school, among other uh, things that he thought were violations of his right to privacy. He took up privacy as a cause. He eventually sued Facebook for his transfer of his personal data from servers in Ireland to servers in the US. Without getting further bogged down in the details, essentially the court agreed with Schrems by finding that the safe harbor was ineffective and the court's decision actually invalidated the safe harbor. In reality, the EU had already been bristling over the US's um, cavalier attitude about handling personal data. The primary example of this, of course, is the Edward Snowden affair. When Snowden exposed the surveillance occurring by the US government and the complicit companies, it was the straw that broke the camel's back for the EU courts. The Schrems Facebook decision was the backlash against the US for this practice and attitude towards data. Clearly, there was no enforcement of the principles in the safe harbor if the NSA and companies could spy on their citizens. Furthermore, there was no way for any EU citizen effectively to address their concerns. So the safe harbor is invalidated and the EU and the US are left to negotiate a new deal. So they come up with the EU-US Privacy Shield framework. The new framework is substantially longer and more detailed than the safe harbor, but it touches on the same themes that the old uh, safe harbor touched on. Notice, choice, accountability, onward transfer, security, data integrity, purpose limitation, access, and enforcement. In the meantime, while all that was going on, the EU went ahead and adopted the GDPR in April 27, 2016. On July 12, 2016, the European Commission deemed the EU-US Privacy Shield framework adequate to enable data transfers under EU law. So we have the framework adopted that allows um, transfer from the EU to the US but we also have the GDPR, which specifically applies to the way companies transfer their data. So let's take a look at the GDPR. It absolutely takes up an enormous time of my, or part of my day. The data of our customers is critical to our business. And as a result, we're incredibly sensitive as to how it's handled. As I mentioned, the GDPR was passed in 2016, but the EU recognized the sweeping changes GDPR would require, so they allowed a two-year ramp-up period for companies to comply. D-Day was May 25, 2018. The enforcement of the GDPR started then. The GDPR is composed of 11 chapters, 99 articles, and 173 recitals which add further context to the articles. So let's discuss some of the highlights of GDPR. As I mentioned, the GDPR with some tweaks echoes the same seven principles as we originally defined in the EU, US, as, sorry, as were originally find, defined in the EU, US Safe Harbor Agreement. Those principles are set forth in Article 5, lawfulness, fairness, and transparency, Article 5 requires, quote, personal data be processed lawfully, fairly, and in a transparent manner in relation to individuals. Essentially, 
All that is is that people need to know what's going on with their personal data. Second principle is purpose limitation. Personal data must be collected for specified, explicit, and legitimate purposes, not further processed in a manner that is incompatible with these purposes. What does all that mean? Well, I'll come back to that in a little bit. Data minimization. Personal data should be adequate, relevant, and limited to what is necessary in relation to the purposes for which they are processed. In other words, don't keep data that isn't needed for your purposes. And here's a real world example for you all. Recently, GoDaddy ran a contest in Italy. We asked small business owners to submit their story about what inspired them to start their small business. The most inspiring story, I'm not sure who the judges were, but of the inspiring story, but pursuant to some panel of judges, won free services from GoDaddy for a year. These were not customers of GoDaddy yet, but on the uh, contest form, the business had asked for the name, the home address, the email, and phone numbers of the contest entries. The fact is we didn't need all that information. Your name and e email address would suffice to contact you if you want. So we required the business to change the contest form to minimize the data we retained. One lucky business owner in Italy now has free services for a year from GoDaddy, and we don't have any more information than we needed from the other folks who entered the contest. Accuracy is the next principle. Personal data shall be accurate and where necessary kept up to date. Every reasonable step must be taken to ensure that personal data that are accurate, having regard to the purposes for which they are processed, are erased or rectified without delay. I'll come back to this in a little bit, but you may have heard about the right to be forgotten, and that's what that's all about. Storage limitation is the next uh, principle. This requires that personal data be kept in, fo in a form which permits identification of data subjects for no longer than is necessary for the purposes for which the personal data are processed. So get rid of the old data. In fact, that reminds me, I need to see if we discarded the data of those Italian contestants. Integrity and confidentiality, that's basically security of personal data is the next principle. You have to process the data in a manner that ensures appropriate security of the personal data, including protection against unauthorized or unlawful processing against accidental loss, destruction, or damage using appropriate technical and organizational measures. Obviously, security is important. Everyone wants to protect data. And it's incredibly difficult where companies acquire or merge with com other companies. What may have been appropriate security measures before may no longer be the case, and the company will have to enhance its security around the personal data it retains. This is certainly the case for GoDaddy, where we've recently acquired smaller companies and now must ensure the security measures are appropriate for a company of our size versus their size. And then there's accountability, which is basically enforcement. Here the GDPR provides, the controller shall be responsible for and be able to demonstrate compliance with all the principles I just discussed. So circling back to the right of erasure, there's an interesting story about how that right first came to be. It's really uniquely a product of the internet age more than anything else. It evolves from a 2014 Europe European Court of Justice case called Google v. Mario Castella Gonzalez. The story of that case begins in 1998 when a Spanish newspaper published two announcements regarding the forced sale of properties arising from social security debts. The announcements were to try to get as many bidders as possible for the set parcels of land. A version of that announcement was also made online. Well, one of those parcels belonged to Mr. Gonzalez. And in 2009, when he did a Google search on his name, he noticed that the link to the embarrassing article still existed. He was not happy about that and asked the newspaper to get the links taken down. When the newspaper declined, he then asked Google to get the link taken down again. Unsurprisingly, neither the newspaper nor Google were at all interested in listening to Mr. Gonzalez, and they rejected his request. Not content with that, 
He brought his case to the East, to the uh, European Court. There, in 2014, the court held that Google has to consider requests from individuals to remove links to their name where the results, quote, appear to be inadequate, irrelevant, or no longer relevant or excessive in light of the time that has elapsed. Although the court never explicitly labels this as the right to be forgotten, it has come to be known as such, and in this case laid the foundation for this principle in the GDPR. So those are the fundamental principles of the GDPR, but practically, and finally we get to this slide, practically the principles can be broken down as the slide shows. First, you have the customer rights. Know what is happening to, or, sorry, transparency, know what is happening to my P PII, the personal, uh, the PII, which is the, the personally identifiable information or personal data. So that's basically just privacy policies that most uh, online services publish now. Then there's consent. The customer has to know what PII is being collected with the ability to change that choice. Then there's update and erasure, which is the right to be forgotten, which I just mentioned. And then there's portability, which is take my PII elsewhere. That's Article 20 of the GDPR, by the way, requires companies to allow customers to have their data and move it to other companies in an easily transferable way. Then there are the company obligations. You can see them there. Integrity and security, of course. Minimization, which we discussed. Notification, we have to tell people about the breaches as well as the authorities. And accountability, we have to have corporate accountability uh, and appoint a DPO, which interestingly enough, and I'll get to this later, some companies have trouble doing. So, well, what does all that mean and how do companies process your data? Well, the answer can be found in Article 6 of the GDPR. There, the GDPR sets forth six lawful bases for processing personal data. Consent, contracts, legal obligations, public interests, vital interests, and legitimate interests. For consent, Article 7 of the GDPR sets out the conditions and, and Recital 32 of, the, of that article provides additional clarity, and I quote, Consent should be given by a clear, by a clear confer, affirmative act, establishing a freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous indication of the data subject's agreement to the processing of personal data relating to him or her, such as by a written statement, including by electronic means, or an oral statement. So that basically means companies can't pre-check those boxes anymore. Although consent would be an easily justifiable basis to market to consumers or to customers. Consent isn't likely to be a popular basis for processing data, mostly because folks won't check those boxes. So we move to contracts. Here the basis is fairly clear. If you have a contract with someone and need to process their personal data to comply with your obligations, then that qualifies as a legal basis to do so. However, any processing you carry out must be necessary for the purposes of fulfilling those obligations. It, the lawful basis for processing data won't apply if there are other ways of meeting those obligations. Thus, this basis likely won't allow you the ability to market to your own customers, to your customers. We can quickly dispense with the other obligations, or, sorry, with the other bases. Legal obligations, you can process data if required, if required by law. Same with public interest, you would carry out the processing of data in your government, if, in your official government capacity, and vital interests, which probably only apply in emergency medical situations. Which leaves us with what I think is the most interesting, and likely to become, if it's not already, the most popular of the bases to process customers' data for marketing purposes, legitimate interests. Indeed, Recital 47 of the GDPR provides that the processing of personal data for direct marketing purposes may be regarded as carried out for a legitimate interest. But it's not quite that easy because Article 61F restricts unfettered, unfettered marketing by requiring processing to be necessary 
for the purposes of the legitimate interest pursued by the controller, and this is key, except where such interests are overridden by the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject, which require protection of the personal data in particular, or the data subject as a child. So clearly, and obviously rightfully, the regulation makes it particularly difficult to, to process data for minors. But what does the rest of the article mean? How do you determine whether your interests in marketing to the customer are not, quote, overridden by the interests or fundamental rights and freedoms of the data subject? Unsurprisingly, the GDPR places the burden of the, on the data controller to determine whether the interests, their interests in processing the personal data really are legitimate. Thankfully, the UK Information Commissioner's Office provides guidance with this balancing test. So hypothetically, let's say we want to market to some of our customers in the EU. We have a contract to provide web hosting for our customer, but we want them now to learn all about our excellent email services. Well, if we don't have any other lawful basis to send them a marketing uh, email, we would put the balancing test to the test. First is the purpose test. Are you pursuing a legitimate interest? The answer here is, in, in our hypothetical, is yes. Recital 47 explicitly covers us. What, uh, why do you want to process the data? What are you trying to achieve? We want to, we want to provide the customer with notice of additional services they may want. Who benefits from the processing and in what way? We believe the customer benefits from this notice by being able to learn about the new features that may be of benefit to them. Are there wider public benefits to the processing? Well, uh, we believe the public uh, benefits from having more people have email, but I'm not sure that's a strong basis. How important are those benefits? I mean, I wouldn't say they're critical to the survival of humankind, but they have some benefit. And what would be the impact if you couldn't go ahead? Um, anarchy in the streets is my guess. <coughs> would your use of the data be unethical or unlawful in any way? Absolutely not. And I love that they have to ask this question. <laughs> Clearly that uh, is born from the fact that there are some scummy companies out there. Um, but it certainly doesn't serve GoDaddy's interest to break the law or spam our customers. The idea is for us to have our customers like us for the long term. So that's the purpose test. And we're still not sure if we have a legitimate interest in uh, processing or marketing to our customers. So now we need to proceed with the necessity test. As the slide says, whether a business can perform its functions without this data. Well, I'm sure we can perform our functions. But taken in the context of our hypothetical, is the processing necessary for that purpose? Our purpose is to tell the customer about our email services. I would say that the processing of his data is certainly necessary. Does this processing actually help to further the interest? In my view, no question. Is there a reasonable way to go about it? I'm sorry, is this a reasonable way to go about it? We think so. Is there another less intrusive way to achieve the same result? So, for example, what about gen general ads on the television or radio? Well, our view would be that those general ads don't achieve the same results, that direct marketing helps or has better results. Um, and so we don't believe that there's a less intrusive way. All right, so we passed the necessity test, at least if I'm the teacher, I say we did. And now we go to the balancing test which is really the key test in my view. Um, in fact, the number one question that the ICO asks is, do the data subject's interests override the legitimate interest? Which I think is sort of the dispositive question here. So we'll come back to that. But what is the nature of your relationship with the individual? This is our customer, so we've been given their information. Is any of the data particularly sensitive or private? Typically not in our case. Would people expect you to use their data in this way? If they know us, probably. Are you happy to explain it to them? Definitely. Are some people likely to object or find it intrusive? I mean, 
plaintiff's attorneys exist for a reason, I suppose. <laughs> what is the possible impact on the individual? Here, I would say it's pretty minimal. You get an email in your inbox. I don't know if it has a big impact on them. That's the next question. How big of an impact might it have on them? Are we processing children's data? Thankfully, no. Are any of the individuals vulnerable in any other way? I don't think so. Can you adopt any safeguards to minimize impact? We can and we do. We try to minimize the data collected, and we certainly try to adopt uh, adequate security measures around that data. And do we offer an opt-out? Once again, we can and we do. So do we have a legitimate interest? Well, candidly, these are the questions that me and my team deal with every single day. As you might imagine, uh, the nuances of each particular marketing campaign create different outcomes. And, legit and the legitimate interest test will be, in my view, a hotly contested and discussed issue as GDPR matures and companies try to find loopholes, et cetera. And as I say, we deal with this every day at GoDaddy, trying to determine how to balance the legitimate interest test. Ultimately, I agree with certain commenters who think it comes down to the concept that legitimate interests are likely to be appropriate if the company uses personal data in ways that the data subjects would deem reasonable and where the processing has a minimal impact on their privacy. One thing's clear, however, where the individual asks for the processing to stop, they have the absolute right to have that processing stop. You uh, might not believe this, but that's easier said than done in some cases. Not too long ago, we sent out a new newsletter to one of, our, or one of our German subsidiaries, sent a newsletter to some of our customers. It just so happens that our um, marketing department decided that um, it would send that newsletter to the opted out customers as well. Um, and I guess they had a faulty list. And the best part about this was we learned about that and then they didn't fix the faulty list and sent the same or a different newsletter, the next newsletter out to the same crew of people. Not surprisingly, we got a complaint from the Data Protection Authority in Germany. But we were able to apologize profusely to the people affected, and we ultimately, finally, I hope, knock on wood, fixed the error. In that case, an apology and fixing the problem resolved the issue. However, it's clear that the data protection authorities are not afraid to bring down the hammer on companies. No fancy graphics for this slide. And they are fancy graphics, by the way, on the other slides. <laughs> uh, it's so great, quite frankly. Check out some of the eye-popping numbers on this slide. In under two years, there have been 175 fines, totaling over 450 million euros. Notable recent, or sorry, Italy's DPA, uh, the Data Protection Authority, that is, who, uh, is the authority over these fines, has been particularly aggressive recently. However, in some cases, I can understand the severity of the fine. So, um, and I'm taking these out of order, in the $11.5 million fine, Italy fined this utility company in, in their country for forging contracts of their customers. It seems to me that that outright fraud or criminal behavior certainly merits a hefty fine. But then they leveled a 27.8 million euro fine on one of their telecom carriers for unsolicited phone calls. This is very much akin to our Telephone Consumer Protection Act. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the time to bore you with the lunacy of that law. But suffice it to say, I'm not a fan. It has its own calls to your home, and only the plaintiff's bar gets rewarded. It's a terrible law, but I digress. Germany has also been active recently. There, the DPA fined one and one telecom, 9.55 million euros. We at GoDaddy were particularly interested in this fine because one and one is more than just a telecom company. It's also a domain name registrar, just like us. Apparently on the telecom side, they weren't treating their records terribly well and they didn't have the proper controls over their data. 
So folks apparently at 101 were able to obtain other people's data with little trouble by making a phone call to 101. Not surprisingly, the DPA wasn't too thrilled with that and tagged them with a, that $11.55 million fine. Sorry, with that $9.55 million fine. That fine, by the way, generated more than a few emails to my inbox since as a registrar like us, our folks were a little worried that we had the uh, proper controls. Um, thankfully, in our preparation for GDPR, as I said, we had a two year run up to it. That was ground well covered. And then I included this small fine against Facebook just to show that the silliest thing can get you fined and DPAs mean business. In that case, Facebook simply didn't inform the Hamburg, Germany DPA who their data protection officer was. It's a simple piece of paperwork. By the way, the DPO, the data protection officer, is required by Article 37 of the GDPR. And it's part of the accountability principle. Controllers are required to publish contact details of the data protection officer and communicate them to the supervisory authority. Facebook didn't do that or didn't think it had to do that for the Hamburg DPA, and it paid 51,000 euros for that mistake. Makes me thankful that the DPA was lenient in our newsletter incident. So I mentioned the preparations for GDPR, and to be sure, at GoDaddy, there was an all hands on deck approach to prepping. We turned over every rock and uh, tried to ensure we covered all our bases. But more importantly, we tried to automate and provide the business with guidance that they could read when they were, uh, with guidance that they could read when they woke up at 3 a.m. in a cold sweat. This slide is actually the result of that work, and this is actually a real, a real uh, web page within our intranet at GoDaddy. We created a library of guidance for our engineers and the business to refer to at any time they had questions about GDPR compliance. And trust me, they had a lot of questions despite this library. So in the spirit of GDPR's transparency principle, we created a trust center for our customers, and many companies have done this. You might uh, go to any, really any sophisticated uh, website, Microsoft, uh, you name it. They all have trust centers now, and we've, I, I, I say now, we weren't exactly the trailblazers. I'm sure we got the idea from somebody. Um, but basically, it's a place on, on the uh, website that allows the customer to see all the good things that the customer, that the company is doing with respect to their data. And truly, it's a good resource for the customer to understand how their data is being used. We updated our privacy policy to make it easier to read. There you go. We also spelled out officially how customer's data is being used. As a, uh, so really, the trust center is a supplement to the privacy policy. And we actually made it easy. So we, this. Fine, this actually required a ton of programming. If you think about it, we didn't have all this built into our online dashboard, right? And so we had to go in and, and um, fiddle with the network, and a bunch of engineers spent a whole lot of time developing this little piece of, of our website. And it's the ability for the customer to easily have the right to be forgotten. And then there's um, customer choice. This is the cookies consent bar that you all probably see on most of the websites you travel to these days. It should give you, if they're collecting data, the option to opt out of those cookies that collect data about you, like how you interact with the website, what website you came from, and where you go next as you surf the web. Those cookies are like gold to marketers. They give ad companies the ability to determine that you might like sports if you just came from ESPN, and they will market to you accordingly. Which brings us to a real world dilemma. So, as some of you probably know, GoDaddy is governed by an entity called ICANN, which is the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. They are the regulators of the internet for the most part. ICANN regulations essentially require that we collect and publish registration data uh, in the WHOIS database, which is like a phone book for domain names. 
So if I registered nickvisor.com, you could go to the Whois directory and determine that Nick Visor actually registered that domain name. And that's public information. Well, that's just the kind of information. It also, by the way, contained my address, my telephone number, my email address. And that's just the kind of information that GDPR said shouldn't be published anymore. So we have a dilemma. We have the purpose limitation and the data minimization that was required by GDPR, but we have ICANN telling us we have to publish that information. Well, the industry, GoDaddy's uh, brethren in the registrar world and GoDaddy went to ICANN and said, listen, we think you're great, but you're a nonprofit, community-run organization. Pardon us if we comply with this other body over here called the European Union. So through much negotiation, ICANN relented on its requirement to publish, to publish the uh, WHOIS information. But there's still a lot of debates about this. And if you'd like to attend the next ICANN meeting, which is in uh, Cancun, by the way, this March, you two can weigh in on the issue. So a little background for this slide. So that directory was used by people to enforce their rights and law enforcement used it as part of its investigatory uh, tactics in any cases that they had, right? They would know right away who registered a domain name. Now that information was gone, and brand owners, those at Inta, um, also used that information to police their marks. Again, the information is now gone, so what do we do? Well, you can imagine that law enforcement wasn't too thrilled about having to get a subpoena for every domain name now that they wanted to investigate. So they negotiated with the industry and it actually turned out that we were able to develop a portal for law enforcement to use that gives them the information that was otherwise publicly available. And they can now use that rather than getting a subpoena or a warrant to get the information related to the registr uh, registrar of the domain name. That has, that's all kinds of, um, uh, there's all kinds of conflict about that and people have a lot of questions about how do you certify as a law enforcement agency, who can use it, what are they asking for, if, if not just the registration information, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but by and large, that seems to be working. But trademark holders and, and rights holders, or uh, uh, IP holders, don't have access to that portal. They are kicking and screaming at every ICANN meeting that they have legitimate interest in seeing that information as well. The industry doesn't necessarily see eye to eye with them because it's one thing if a law enforcement officer wants to investigate a crime, it's another thing if a brand holder wants to police their mark, why can't they get a subpoena? Well, um, again, you can go to Cancun and you can find out the exciting conclusion to this uh, story because the rights holders will be there taking and screaming in March. <coughs> All right, moving along. That pretty much is GDPR. But we've got Brexit too, and obviously being the international GC, that was something that came across my desk, um, I don't know, six or seven times, I'm not sure how many times the, the Brits threatened to leave. But it looks like they're finally doing it now. And after an initial panic attack about what that would mean for us as a business, it looks like it won't affect us terribly much. I think the current regulatory regime, the GDPR for the time being in the transition period, uh, and the UK's Data Privacy Act will stay in effect. Um, so that will flow freely between the two countries. And both sides say they're committed to ensuring a high level of personal data protection to facilitate such flows between them. And the hope is to have agreements made by the end of the transition period. I'm sure there will be something negotiated like the Privacy Shield framework that we have already in place with the EU. And there will be an adequacy decision uh, rendered by the EU to allow for this third party flow of the third party country flow of that. But it is, after all, the US and the UK governments. So this all may take some time, 
And in the meantime, we have to be very careful about what controls we have over our data. Okay, so that's Brexit. We've covered GDPR. What else is out there? So there's a proposal in the EU called the Digital Services Act, which has me scared, quite frankly. Basically, among other things, what this act will do is uh, wipe out the safe harbor that intermediaries like GoDaddy enjoy when um, information or content is published over our pipes. So we currently have a law in the United States called the Communications Decency Act, and Section 230 of that act provides a safe harbor for folks like us at GoDaddy where we don't create or develop the content that's going over our systems. If that gets wiped away, and our immunity is gone, you can imagine how that might have a chilling effect on the internet. We will now be responsible for every 19 million customers' content. I don't know how we're gonna police that. I don't know what we're gonna deem as allowable, um, because what may be allowable to us may not be allowable to under the act, and may be allowable in one country and not the other. It's gonna be exceedingly difficult to navigate that if this act passes. So we'll keep our eye on that. I put Brazil in here because they actually recently passed their own, you know, uh, sister to the uh, GDPR. But really why Brazil is in here is because, believe it or not, that's where GoDaddy has the majority, I, I shouldn't say the majority, but it has more cases in Brazil than anywhere else in the world. And I have no idea, and if anybody here does, I'd love to know why Brazil is so litigious. But I'll tell you what it sure it is. Most of it is over IP rights, but now that they have this new Privacy Act uh, in place, we're watching it because I'm sure it'll start a bunch of lawsuits there. Apparently, Brazilians like to sue a lot. Um, India is recently, has recently proposed uh, the Personal Data Protection Bill. In December, it made its way to Parliament there. This act is lunacy as well. It has all the standard principles of the GDPR and goes a little bit further in that it also uh, makes intermediaries liable for the contents. It also calls for, importantly, data localization. And all that means is that we have to keep records of our Indian customers in India, which sounds like an easy thing, except for we don't keep records of customers in India in India. We keep them in Arizona in our headquarters and our data centers there. So we'd have to rent data centers out there in India. We'd have to make sure the controls are there and it would be certainly an imposition on us and all businesses uh, like us who have Indian customers. And unlike Brazil where, the, where we don't have a huge presence yet there's just a disproportionate amount of litigation, we actually have a huge presence in India, and a lot of my time is focused on India. Um, it's both litigious um, and just creates a ton of problems. Um, I, I guess the problems occur because their law enforcement agencies don't really follow the rule of law as we see it. They want their uh, data when they ask for it, and they won't take no for an answer. They threaten to throw our folks in jail more than once. And I will say, sort of calms our, our Indian folks down when I tell them that the number one directive of my boss, uh, the chief legal officer of GoDaddy, is to make sure that none of our employees end up in jail. So when push comes to shove, I'm sorry, customer, your data is going to go to the Indian law enforcement and our folks will stay out of jail. Um, but we're watching this law very carefully because if it passes, it will also create a lot of haze. All right, which brings us to the United States and this little act called the California Consumer Protection Act, which some of you may have heard of. Uh, this act is actually, really owes its, its uh, life to the Facebook Cambridge Analytica uh, kerfuffle. There, um, if, you, if you recall, Facebook allowed Cambridge Analytica to harvest the data of 50 plus million Facebook customers. And it gave that data or allowed that data to be given to um, a certain political uh, 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 
pollsters who use that data to sway the presidential election, some people say. Just this past November, the FTC issued its final order, finding what we already knew. If you liked How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days, George W. Bush, and Hip Hop, you could be linked with conservative and conventional personality, and Facebook allowed Cambridge Analytica to give that data away. That's actually true, that's in the FTC order. One interesting requirement of the CCPA is that it requires all forms of CPA, CCPA required notices to be accessible to consumers with disabilities. As we'll discuss in just a few minutes, I'm not sure anyone can sufficiently tell me what accessible means, but I'll get back to that in a sec, like I said. Although, I, well, I should say, the California Attorney General actually responded and said, quote, businesses shall follow generally recognized industry standards for accessibility, which can be found at the World Wide Web Consortium's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. Okay, well, we'll come back to that, as I said. There are other minor differences between the CCPA and the GDPR, like how does it define data, um, and requiring companies to provide a consumer with a do not sell my personal information link in a clear and conspicuous location on the homepage. But GoDaddy does not sell customer information, so while we will make certain changes to our data processing practices, we are already more or less in compliance with the CCPA. Still, I can't wait for the jurisprudence on what constitutes clear and conspicuous for this link. As you might imagine, some businesses that derive revenue from the sale of your information might have different, a different definition of what clear and conspicuous is than you. Indeed, I've already seen more than a few links literally at the very bottom of companies' homepages in smaller font than the rest of the page. Is that clear and conspicuous? I suspect an enterprising citizen will put that to the test sooner or later. Of course, uh, one major difference with the GDPR is the ability to maintain a private right of action and to recover damages of up to $750 per violation. As you know, we uh, Californians like to sue. So we'll see how that all plays out. And indeed, we already have a case that's been filed. Uh, Barnes v. Hannah Anderson and Salesforce is pending in the Northern District of California, as you can see. And Barnes alleges negligence and failure to maintain reasonable safeguards, among other things, leading to a data breach. The, com the complaint specifically speaks, seeks recovery under the CCPA. The background of that case is that in 2009, Hackers obtained credit card information and other personal data from Hannah Anderson's files. Hannah Anderson notified the affected parties of the breach in January of 2020, and then Barnes filed her complaint on February 3rd. But I actually don't think Barnes's case is going to survive a motion to dismiss. Um, to bring in action for statutory damages under the CCPA, consumers must first notify the business of the alleged violation. The business then has 30 days to cure that violation and provide the customer with a, an express quote, an express written statement that the violations have been cured and that no further violations shall occur. It does not appear an opportunity to cure was provided in this case. And also the breach occurred in 2019. That's before the CCPA was actually effective. It wasn't effective until January 1, 2020. And for that matter, the Attorney General won't start enforcing the provisions of the CCPA until July 1, 2020. And thank goodness for that, because we're counting that as our deadline, by the way, because we still have a few changes left to make. Suffice it to say, uh, I don't think Barnes and her attorneys will get very far, although they made a nice splash being what I think is the first case to uh, loop in the CCPA as a, as a uh, cause of action. So other states, have passed or soon will pass uh, privacy laws. This will create a nearly impossible patchwork and exceedingly difficult regulatory environment with which to comply. However, I know we're already seeing attacks on these laws. In an interesting uh, case recently, Maine's privacy law is under attack by an association comprised of ISPs. ACA Connects v. Fry, Connects v. Fry 
was filed on Valentine's Day in the Federal District of Maine. And essentially, the ISPs claim that the law is unconstitutional, the Maine privacy law is unconstitutional, because it unfairly targeted, uh, it is unfairly targeted towards ISPs and unnecessarily restricts ISPs' ability to collect and process data of their customers. As we'll find out, ISPs may not be able to process data of their customers very much any longer anyway, and I'll get to that in a little bit. But it's interesting, it's a tricky thing to attack a privacy statute. Think about it, if you're an entity, you don't want to be out there saying, hey, I'm against privacy, I want this privacy law taken out, you know, taken off the books. That's why I'm certain that the first sentence, of, that's why the first sentence of this complaint is, quote, plaintiffs and their members, which include internet service providers, are committed to protecting their customers' privacy. So committed that they sued to have the law thrown out. <clears throat> we'll see whether other companies are bold enough to challenge these laws and what the courts do here. But in the meantime, my hope is that the, this patchwork of laws is overridden by Congress. Luckily, Congress actually appears to have noticed this dilemma. Both parties have actually even introduced federal privacy bills. And while that's encouraging, unfortunately, it wouldn't be the first time Congress paid lip service to a, fixing a problem without actually fixing it. So, if we'll see, so we'll see if anything comes to fruition here. But pardon me if I'm skeptical. I'll set the over-under for a federal privacy bill at 2024. By the way, the two parties' bills are mostly identical with two critical exceptions. Whereas the Democrats' bill has limited preemption, and allows the states to pass more stringent laws, and also allows, by the way, for a private right of action. The Republicans' bill includes total preemption of state laws and doesn't allow for private rights of action. I'm sure you can all tell where I'm headed with this. My view is that the Republicans' bill should pass, and frankly, there's, a, there's more than just a business justification for that, or over. This is a business justification as well, which is, Without total preemption, federal privacy law would really just be the same as we are now, right? Because states could continue to pass their own laws more stringent, and we'd still be left with this patchwork of laws where we wouldn't have, we wouldn't be able to figure out which laws to comply with or not, and it would actually be a lowest common denominator type thing where we'd have to comply with the most stringent law. All right, so back to the ADA. This area of law is actually exploding as well, maybe not as much as privacy, but it certainly comes across my desk a lot. Um, the ADA doesn't refer to websites or include any standards for achieving compliance with web accessibility. As I say there, the law was actually passed before the first website was even published. Nevertheless, the courts have been split on the issue of ADA applicability. The general divide turns on whether the ADA applies to websites if you do not maintain a brick and mortar location. Moreover, back in 2010, the DOJ set out the WCAG guidelines, which I referred to a little bit earlier, for notice and comment, but then they pulled them back. And while the DOJ suggests the guidelines should be considered the law insofar as accessibility is concerned, They've never actually gone through the process of making them true regulations. So the law, the, the law continues to be a muddied, a very muddied on this issue. Now to be crystal clear, regardless of the legal application to, to, uh, by the, of the ADA to GoDaddy, accessibility is actually something that we take very seriously. It's quite frankly not really a huge segment of our population, but it's important that we treat all of our customers with respect, and we certainly don't want to turn any customers away. And so we're making um, our website more accessible every day. Um, and I advise our uh, folks working on that, the engineers and the developers, how to comply with the guidelines and the laws. I also advise on what might be a reasonable accommodation where we can't really make our website accessible. So, an interesting case just occurred last January. 
Hey, Nick, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but uh, I want to make sure you have time to, uh, for questions. If you, uh, oh, yeah. if, if, yeah, I, don't, I don't know where you are in the. Thank you. Yeah, yes, sorry. well, I'll speed up. Um, and I won't. So I will go fast here. Uh, thank you, Dave. And really quickly, if anybody's got a 615 that they're waiting around for, go to your class. He knows that Absolutely. Sorry, didn't notice the time. That's okay. Um, so listen, Robles was a blind man who tried to access the um, Domino's Pizza website on two occasions. He tried to order a pizza. He claims that he couldn't do so because the site wasn't ADA accessible. And in January, the Ninth Circuit remanded the case back to the district court saying the ADA applied to Domino's because it had a brick and mortar site. And Domino's was not denied due process because the DOJ failed to issue proper regulations. So I suspect this case will probably settle, but suffice it to say, we're watching very closely because ultimately, if the courts come down and, this, and the circuits um, finally get their act together and start to be consistent, and they say it does apply if you don't have a brick and mortar store, then the law absolutely applies to us and we'll absolutely have to ensure that we speed up whatever processes we're already working on. All right, so we are nearing the end actually, thankfully, mercifully, for you all. <laughs> Uh, here are some bold predict predictions from me. And given that I'm a lawyer, I want to make sure to properly disclaim these as forward-looking statements. All right, the first prediction is highly technical, but in my view, is a cause for concern. So it's DNS over HTTP, HTTPS. What does that mean? And if anybody in here knows what it means, you guys are definitely coders. Um, so it has to do with internet protocols and internet browsers like Chrome and Mozilla, so Google and Mozilla, have implemented these changes, although it's important to note that they don't yet have the default on for these changes just yet. But here's what they're saying, or here's what these changes do. Remember I said the ISPs, the internet service providers, typically provide the internet to you when you dial when you uh, <coughs> type in GoDaddy.com, you're doing that over your internet service provider's service, right? You use a browser like Chrome to get to GoDaddy.com, and both parties typically have the data that comes from that, right? So they process that data. They know that Nick Beiser went to GoDaddy.com on X date, whatever. They know that I went to ESPN. They know that I went wherever I went. Well, ISPs have been using that data to market to their customers the same way any other business would. <clears throat> well, Google and Cloudflare and Mozilla and others on the browser side have figured out a way to keep that data from getting to the ISPs. So the ISPs no longer have visibility into their customers. And Google already has that data, so you would think there's no real danger there, except for ultimately Google in particular We'll start to have all the data in the world, and they'll be the only ones with that data. Um, and so, if you if you consolidate all that data with Google, uh, you could put other companies at competitive disadvantages, and you could see potentially antitrust stuff, which some of you may have already seen in the news. Our regulators are already uh, interested in Google's antitrust uh, activities. Um, so, that's DNS over HTTPS. Um, so this one, I listened to this podcast called Pivot. I highly recommend it uh, to folks if they're interested in the tech industry. Um, it's hosted by Kara Swisher and Scott Galloway, as you see there. On one of these podcasts, they, uh, so Kara, by the way, is a, is a tech reporter. I don't know if you all have heard of her or Scott Galloway, but he's in, a professor of business at NYU. Um, they discuss two areas that were ripe for disruption, U.S. education and U.S. healthcare. And in particular, Professor Galloway's premise was that U.S. healthcare was Byzantine and, and as I said, ripe for disruption. So what does this have to do with the tech world? Well, the theory that they espoused was that the big tech companies will enter the space, Apple, Google, and Amazon to be specific, and those three companies who already have massive amounts of data about you will also have your personal health information as well. So I can only imagine what the in-house attorneys for those companies are dealing with in terms of ensuring their companies are equipped to handle 
pH high. But my bold prediction with proper credit to the Pivot podcast is that the future headlines of privacy will be along the health data as opposed to financial and personal, uh, personally identifiable information data. All right, so this is an interesting one. IKEA Dubai, or the IKEA in Dubai, has offered free furniture, or, or I'm sorry, not free. It is, it is a program where it has allowed its customers to pay for furniture with their time. So what it's saying is, if you show me that you drove from X to, to, to you know, from wherever you were to Ikea, and then you spend X number of hours in our store, you get to get, you get to pay with that time. All you need to do is show us the Google information, the Google Maps that shows us where you were. So once again, Google has all this data, and if it shares it with the stores it's now partnering with, who knows where your data is going and who knows how it will be used by those stores. And then finally, I'm sure everyone is very excited. This is the last um, slide. <coughs> so you all may have heard that Facebook settled a recent case, Patel v. Facebook. It was actually in the Ninth Circuit, uh, but it was dealing with the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act, BIPA. The settlement was for $550 million. And what it said was that Facebook was improperly scanning photographs on people's Facebook pages and taking that data and using it without people's consent. That's a violation of BIPA, and Facebook had to settle. The bold prediction here is that as facial recognition and brain monitoring technology, which is new and upcoming, no cases on that that I know of, um, but brain monitoring technology continue to proliferate as they continue to proliferate. You'll see more and more lawsuits and potentially more and more settlements of the $550 million and up range. My only hope for the future is that you don't see GoDaddy's name on those settlements. <laughs> Thank you for coming, listening to me drone on about these things. Let me open the floor for questions or anything else. I know people probably have to go, so thank you. Planning to attend the reception if we invite all of you to come. We're going to be happy to take more questions. Are there one or two questions that anybody has? Um, considering how a lot of this pending litigation is in the Ninth Circuit, do you think the Supreme Court will back for any of them or just let the Ninth Circuit take care of all of these things? For for all of these issues, so for ADA and, and or like any like the I guess because tech is so concentrated in that circuit. Yes. Do you think they'll just let them take care of that themselves or grant certain interests? I mean, you know, my typical um, experience with the Supreme Court, which which isn't much, um, is that they don't really take cert unless there's a split in the circuits. So, for example, I actually expect that the ADA stuff might warm its way up to the Supreme Court because there's a number of circuits that have opined on that ADA stuff, on accessibility to websites, and the split is so sort of, um, uh, you know, it's so sort of obvious. It has to do, again, with whether you have a brick and mortar store, and that makes you have a, a, a place under the ADA that you have to then make your website accessible because it's um, incident to the brick and mortar store. Whereas just because I don't have a brick and mortar store and you are, you know, uh, you can't see and you need to use a screen reader. I'm not, I don't have to uh, uh, comply with the ADA. That doesn't seem to add up to me. Like I say, I expect the, the Supreme Court to take the ADA uh, stuff up. The other stuff, you know, sort of privacy, I actually think it may get there as well because of just the disparate nature of the privacy laws. Um, but hopefully Congress will actually act and pass a law and then you know, things will kind of settle down for a while until someone figures out a way to challenge that. But um, until then, you know, I don't think the Supreme Court will take it, not because it's Ninth Circuit specific and Ninth Circuit has any special expertise on tech related stuff or not. I think it's more about whether the circuits are split.
Yes, sir. <coughs> so, um, to, are you affected by China at all? And what's their effect on like the global privacy? <coughs> Um, I think that that's a great question, um, and the answer is yes, I'm affected greatly by China. We actually have folks in China, um, but we don't have customer data in China, and we actually don't offer any services technically uh, from any entity in China. So any services we offer in China are offered from our Arizona corporation. Um, and so. The privacy laws and sort of all the laws in China don't affect us too much. And actually law enforcement for the most part stays away from us there. All our little entity in China does is market um, our services for particular types of services about sort of trading in domain names and what's called the aftermarket. If some of you are domainers here, you can buy and sell domain names online in an auction or, or you know, to the highest bidder or whatever. Um, and so, China, China has a lot of domainers, and so we try to market to them and keep our customers happy over there. But by and large, the Chinese authorities recognize that we aren't really there, we're only there in a certain capacity, and they don't, they don't buy us. Um, but employment laws um, and you know, tax laws and other laws do affect me in China, and I have to deal with those from time to time. Did you have a question, Liz? Uh, yeah. So if the U.S. does enact federal privacy legislation, what, if any, administrative agency do you think should be tasked with that enforcement? Uh, I, I suspect that would be commerce, um, just because it's where it would fall. Uh, FTC as well, I'm, I'm sure FTC would be involved, um, you know, just because they, of the um, misleading and deceptive stuff that would be sort of part and parcel with privacy. So FTC and commerce right now sort of controls the internet. And so much of this stuff is um, you know, related to the internet that I would imagine sort of both of those um, committee, you know, both of those bodies would be somehow involved. I might say they govern the internet as opposed to control it, because I'm not sure that anybody actually controls the internet, but. Um, you know, it's, it's funny you say that, um, Professor, I, I actually, Hope, wish that they would exercise more control. I'm not going to disagree with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for Thank coming. Thank you. All right, enjoy the reception. Yes, the reception is outside. I'll be really quick so that you